Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Are you ready? Good evening. Hello, everyone. I'm Melanie Baker. I'm the Associate Director at the Institute, and welcome to Part 2 of Father Hanley's talk. We're so delighted to have him back. The reason I'm here and not Deacon Sabatino, it's his seventh wedding anniversary today. Yeah, and uh, just between us, he did suggest to his wife that he would take her out to the Institute for <laughs> the anniversary. Anyway, um, I'm just going to go ahead and invite Father Hanley up now so he can say our opening prayer, and we'll go ahead and get started. It's wonderful to be with you again, and we'll, we'll begin with a prayer like we did last time. In fact, we'll begin with the same prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you so much for coming. It's a great grace to, to be with you again this week and to speak about such a beautiful thing as the communion of saints. Uh, of course, we have it under the title of One Mediator Between God and Man, Jesus Christ, Mary and the Saints, the Catholic version. I think it's Catholic explanation of that. Catholic understanding, actually, is what it is. And it's very beautiful. I hope that last week we, we saw the beauty of what God did in bringing about the communion of saints. In a real simple way, just to review and to refresh, the simplest way I could put it is that when we see the economy of salvation, the way God does things, the way he works, we saw that he does the deed that saves all, once for all on the cross, but then to apply that to everybody in the world, he creates his church, calls his church into being, animates it, of course, with himself, with the Spirit. The very power of God animates the church, holds it in being, but yet it consists of men and women. It consists of people. It has a structure, structure here down on earth with a hierarchical structure with Peter, the apostles and their successors in the Pope and in the bishops and in the clergy and in the faithful. And within that reality that he established here on earth, that people's salvations are actually intertwined. Put it another way, God uses instruments. Fancy term, we talk about secondary causality, right? God uses other things to reach out, to touch, to convert, as occasions for conversion, as means of conversion, and, and God does this. And not only that, God calls us even to participate, not just in, in what we see before our eyes, hey, I'm going to go tell someone about Jesus, but also, Lord, Turn his heart. Turn his heart to you. The prayer, the intercession that we do here on earth, that changes hearts, that, that converts. And that's the intercession. And that's the sharing in the, in the communion of saints here on earth. And that whole reality is how God applies the grace of his salvation. That's how he applies the grace of his salvation to us. And the simple point about the communion of saints is that when people live holy lives, love one another here, and try to bring other people to Christ through their prayers and their good deeds. When they do that under the operation of God's grace, does it stop when they go to heaven? Of course not. It continues. That's the saints in heaven. The saints in heaven, that's why we say they're the church triumphant. Bonds are not broken. The bonds continue. And they continue to help us. They continue to lead us to Christ. They continue, most importantly, to pray and intercede for us to our Lord. What a beautiful, beautiful thing this is. And I think that's, that's the one thing we have, to, we have to always be checking ourselves, our outlook towards things of the faith. 
How do we view them? Sometimes people say, do I have to do this? As a priest, you get the line. The best is you have a 2.30 wedding. Father, do I have to go to Mass tomorrow? <laughs> My smart aleck response is always the same. You get to go to Mass tomorrow. My goodness. If, but, but when we realize that what's going to happen, and the Mass is the obvious version, we realize what's going to happen when, when we finally get the God's eye view. And we go before him, and we're going to realize exactly what we had before us in the Eucharist. Even if the priest was boring. And even if everybody there were sloppy messes. But we have before us, you know, the, the, the richness, the goodness. God only gives good things. Everything. And every teaching. Whether it's the truths about the natural law that are taught so clearly and beautifully to us by the church. It's good. And it's our disorder that makes us see them not as good. And same with the saints. Do I have to have devotion to the saints? No, you get to have devotion to the saints. What is devotion? It's friendship. It's relationship with all these incredible people. Amazing people who love you. Love you more than you can even understand. Because now they love with a very pure love that's in Christ. And you get to love them. And you get to seek their advice and their help. So it's good for us to check our outlook. If we go, do I have to do this? Or is the church requiring this or not? As soon as we ask that question, we're, we're kind of, we missed it. We've missed the point because we've missed what the church is. It's not just some sort of rule machine. It's God's church here on earth, handing out the good things that God intends us to have. And, of course, the communion of saints are one of the most beautiful manifestations of God's goodness. And, and the whole reality is it's a familial reality within the church in which relationships are made and aid is extended in the love of Christ. We are, by nature, familial. Some people say we're relational. Though that's, that's even more generic. But we're really even, we can even say we're, we're familial. We're, we're made for not just relations generically. We're made for relations brother-sister. Father-son, daughter-son, son-mother. That's what we're made for. Those are the familial, spousal relationships. We're made for those things. Those are the relationships we're made for. And in the communion of saints, our Lord expands a familial reality that is built into us in a natural way, and he gives it to us in a spiritual way now. And expands it in a huge and beautiful way. Of course, with God our Father as our Father, with so many other beautiful people and wonderful people as our brothers and sisters, and a new mother. And we'll talk about that tonight as well. Of course, as I said, with three parts to the church, the church militant here on earth that we see, then there's a church that we don't see, which is vast, beautiful, and powerful. There's the church in transition, the church suffering, the poor souls in purgatory, who we pray for. And in that prayer, we open up a beautiful spiritual commerce with them in which they can then pray and help us. And then, of course, there's a church triumphant, which are the saints in heaven. And there are three aspects of our relationship with the saints in heaven, which I spoke about last week, and that will be kind of the meat of the talk tonight, and we'll focus on. The three aspects of the relationship are venerating the saints, honoring the saints. The second is looking to them for example. And the third, which is the most important, seeking their help. Their help, their friendship, their aid, their intercession. That's the most important. Uh, it's always a good thing to say, Prayer for people is the most important thing we do. Prayer of holy people is really powerful. Prayer of the saints is even better. Prayer of the saints in the sight of God is probably one of the most powerful and greatest things that we have uh, to receive. And so I want to look at each of these aspects and their interrelation with each other. And then I want to look at the two greatest saints that we have and their unique relationships with us that, of course, stem from their unique relationship with Christ. And for Our Lady, unique relationship even with the Trinity and each person of the Trinity in a beautiful new way. But first I'm going to look at venerating the saints. Of course, I said last week, we don't worship the saints, we venerate them. We honor them. And if we think about honoring someone, we honor someone because they've achieved something. Honoring the saints, and what is that? It's the feasts, the memorials, it's the prayers, it's the, it's the kind of the, the retelling of the story in the feast days, remembering every year the saints, it's building the shrines. It's having the pictures. It's, it's maybe even acknowledging the pictures of them, the statues, those small things. Of course, 
these are not idols, we know that. They're honoring people who did great things. And, and we can simply say, first and foremost, on the lowest bar, it's an act of justice. One of the big things is, um, we just got done a few years ago now, building the World War II Memorial. And most people's attitude towards the World War II Memorial was what? It's about time. It's about time we put something on the mall for those guys. Uh, knowing, especially before they leave us, you know, when we, when we start losing people that fought in that horrific yet heroic struggle. We need to honor them. And it's about what, what's behind it. Justice, giving them their due. First, venerating the saints is, is simply just giving someone their due. They deserve it. They deserve it. And there's another part of it, in that whole familiar reality of the church, when we're remembering them, we're remembering our forebearers with a kind of pride. I don't mean a sinful pride, but the kind of pride that, that we as Catholics say, yeah, these are our people. And when we hear about a great saint that did great things, like these are our people. Even we remember during the lifetime of John Paul, we were all, even, and especially during his passing, at least I felt that, I think most people, we were just like proud of this guy. Like, yeah, that's our Pope. Anybody else want to stand anybody against him? He's our Pope. You know, what a great saint. Mother Teresa, another one. Can anybody compare with her? The way she does what she does? And then we look back at all the great saints and the various things the great saints did. Paul and all the amazing things, how he was just relentless. Francis Xavier, Ignatius, those guys. What amazing, amazing saints. And so there's a certain kind of just pride, not cocky, not triumphalistic, but a humble knowing of this is what we're about. This is what we're about. This is what we do. I may not be able to reach up where they are, but I'm in the same, I'm in their, I'm in the same church they are, and they're, they're with me. They're my brothers and they're my sisters. And then with that, there's just also, when we venerate them, there's, there's a certain kind of joy in seeing people whom we care for, have affection for. We should have affection for the saints. When we see someone else doing something pious and really loving Our Lady, it should make us feel good. When we see someone else that really likes St. Anthony, we're like, oh, yeah. I love St. Anthony too, you know. There's that, there's that kind of um, communal feeling of joy in seeing them get their due and seeing other people recognize their goodness and their greatness. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's sort of, I, I was liking it like, yeah, I got to see one of my brothers in the military get an award once and to be there. It was wonderful. It was great to see it. I was full of pride. People said great things about him. Everybody was there was congratulating and I was just, you know, said the prayer and watched my brother get an award. But it's even better than getting one yourself, to a certain extent. And that's what it is with the saints. When we see the saints loved, when we see the saints kind of put forward, it's a beautiful kind of pride. I don't mean that in a sinful way, but I mean in a, in a kind of humble way. We're proud of it, we love it, and we enjoy it. But even more than that, even more than all of these things, when we celebrate the saints, we celebrate and honor God more than anything else. Because they are his handiwork. Remember what we said? It's God moving people. It's God, them saying yes to God, and we're seeing God, what God can do. In the preface for martyrs, second preface, there's lots of prefaces that's the part of the Mass after that dialogue, the Lord be with you and all is with you, lift up your hearts, that part of the Mass. Then there's that longer prayer in preparation for going right into the Eucharistic prayer, into the canon, Right? But in it, usually has something to do with the day, and we speak to our Lord, giving Him praise, and praising Him for specific things, and thanking Him for specific things. This is just a portion of this, and this is the one for martyrs, the second one. There's two options for martyrs. For you are glorified when your saints are praised, addressing the Father. Their very suffering are but wonders of your might. Suffering of the saints, the fortitude of the saints, wonders of your might. In your mercy you give ardor to their faith. To their endurance you grant firm resolve. And in their struggle, the victory is yours through Christ our Lord. You see that? I mean, it's, it's very beautiful. It's, the prayers of the Mass tell us so much. It's so theologically rich. And with our new translation, it's so wonderful because it comes out uh, so, so much clearer to us now. But that's it. When we praise the saints, we know we're not worshiping them. We know. We're seeing our Father's fingerprints everywhere, right? That's why we love praising the saints. Veneration and commemorating the saints also, and this is a very beautiful thing, gives us hope. Because as I said, we see our Father's fingerprints all over these people. 
We see what God can do in someone. And then for that, it's a reminder of what God can do in us. What God's power can do in humanity. And we really see the people and who they are and who they were and who they became. We see their situations and where they, a lot of them where they could have been. Think about St. Rita. She had it horrible. Difficult, terrible, you know, difficult marriage. Difficult boys. You know, her, her life was, was very difficult. And she could have checked out. She did a lot of things, but she said yes to God. In probably the midst of deep misery, said yes to him. And there it goes. And think about this one, Longinus. Longinus, tradition tells us, is who? That's one of the Roman soldiers who pierced the side of Christ. Probably participated in all the other stuff that they did to him. Think about that. Saint Longinus. He was one of the, one of the men who tortured and mocked our Lord. And he's a saint. What God can do to us. St. Augustine, we know what his life was like before. How God can break into our lives. It gives us great hope. The apostles, you know, I'm, I'm giving extreme examples, but the apostles, just ordinary guys, good men probably. I would say they were good men, hardworking men. Kind of men you'd like to be friends with. Just the kind of men you just want to try to be, yet they were pulled out of their comfortable life. And what? The foundations of everything. Our Lord builds upon them. St. Peter, he blows his big moment, right? He does. Not, not actually, I mean, I, I, I love St. Peter, so I'm going to have to go on the side about here. Because St. Peter is not to be looked at as, as some guy who was a chump, weak, or anything. Nobody else got out of the boat and started walking on water. He did. <laughs> He was a gutsy guy. He was a very gutsy guy. And he was all in. But he was all in as a man. And what did our Lord say? Get behind me, Satan. You think as man does and not as God. But for a man, he was very impressive. And, but eventually that gave out. And that's why he failed him. And that's why he denied him three times. And that was his big moment, so he thought. And yet, from that big moment, he falls down, and in his repentance, our Lord lifts him up and lets him confess him again, and then again, and again, and again, and again. And we see Peter on the Pentecost with his great, first great homily of the Christian era, and then we see him become the first pope, and we know he dies a martyr's death, emulating our Lord in Rome, leading the church. Benedict Labore, mentally ill, homeless, saint. What God can do what God can do. Anthony of Padua, he had all his big plans, going to go convert the Muslims or die trying, shipwrecks, mess, ends up in a university town, the last place he wants to be, and he becomes St. Anthony, right? But that was not his plan, not his idea. How many, how, many, how many times can we identify with so many saints whose plans were dashed? And not bad plans, like that was generous. He wanted to go for the sake of Christ. And our Lord said, not that way. I have a slower version for you. You're going you're to come. <laughs> but, but we can identify with, with, with people like him. And this leads us to the next aspect of our relationship with the saints. As we start seeing what God can do for them, we also start seeing in them, in their response, in their cooperation, and what happens throughout their life, we see in the multitude of saints and the variety of missions an example of how the Christian life can be lived. So many different personalities, so many different circumstances, so many different ways and walks of life. In all times, cultures, and situations, they were saints. And it's hard almost now to find a saint that did not have an analogous situation to whatever situation we could possibly face. Just the variety is staggering. I love this phrase, I don't know who came up with this, more variety in saints than in sinners. Many more varieties. There's only seven varieties of sinners, and, and there are a, an infinite possible number, a variety of, of saints. Not infinite because, you know, people are finite and the numbers will be finite, but basically tons and tons. For every soul God creates, there's a unique saint, a unique way in which that person can live out the life of Christ. From Maximilian Kolbe, who was an amazing guy, an entrepreneur, started the biggest radio station, the biggest printing press, started all, all these foundations, has it all ripped away from him, ends up in Auschwitz, and even there exudes joy, working on half a lung and doing what he did, how, of course, with, with God, and then giving his life, that type of martyr, to St. Agnes, 
completely different place, completely different circuses. Another martyr in the midst of Rome, little girl, brought into the circus, into the, into the great amphitheater there, uh, that's now Piazza Navona, threatened, cajoled, mixed between threatened, tortured, and be, being given anything she'd want, and holding true to Christ and her desire to be all his. From St. Louis of France, King Louis, who stayed right where he was, born a prince, stayed a prince, was a Franciscan, uh, and yet he lived that spirit, he lived right where he was, he was a saint, he even lived poverty as a king. He wore the crown, wore what he had to wear, but he was detached from it, and he lived a saint right where he was, as a father, as a husband, as a king. That was his job, and he did it well. He lived as a saint, did what he's supposed to do. He didn't even always succeed at it. You know where he died. He died in North Africa on another failed crusade that he led, but he kept leading them because he felt called to lead them. Compare him to St. Francis, his patron. St. Francis leaves everything because God calls him in a different way. He leaves his wealth, and of course we know he lives, he wanders about uh, preaching the word. From people like, with personalities like St. Philip Neri, who was known for joking, known for gathering men around him. People just loved being with him. He was fun. He sometimes even gave joking penances to people. A lot of great stories. But there was one story, one of his very bright young protégés, uh, who was a priest, gave a, gave a talk, and it was a great talk. And St. Philip said, that was such a wonderful talk. Do it again. <laughs> Tomorrow. And then he, so he did it again. He said, no, do it the next day. And do it the next, he made him do it multiple times in a row So the guy was just sick of giving the talk to just basically say, it's not about giving great talks. It's about something else. But St. Philip, with that kind of, you know, we go see a twinkle in his eye, and then St. Jerome, no twinkle in his eye, right? <laughs> he had a few people that he could put up with him, and he, he you know, he, he, he mortified his anger. You know, we, there was always the famous picture of St. Jerome with the rock <laughs> beating his chest. But again, the, these examples of, I have an irascible personality. Well, so what? Beat your chest with rocks if you have to, but you've got to be a saint, right? I'm not recommending that as... <laughs> to, to just coming from completely different circumstances and people who could come together. Charles Barmeo, the Renaissance prince who left it all, right? Had it all at his disposal. When he died, he had nothing left because he, he kept giving and giving and giving away. To Kateri Tekawitha, born, you know, we know she, she was born in her own country when there's not much here and in very primitive circumstances. And you think of the difference of those two people. And yet, there they are, both saints in the church, both people who we can venerate, both people who we can call upon for their prayer and intercession. And that's why we say the, God, the saints are the Gospels written in time, rewritten in each and every age. Christ rewrites the Gospels in lives. And he can do it in, in such a multifarious way. Because there's so many ways to respond to Christ in so many different circumstances. He reproduces himself, he reproduces his life in humanity. And as a gospel of sorts, uh, the reading of the lives of saints, the contemplating of the lives of saints, have a power beyond just the contemplation of facts. It's not just facts that we see, and we have a kind of a catalog of what they did. Not only gives us kind of an example, an idea, but there's a supernatural power in the contemplation of the saints that move us. Analogous, not the same, but analogous to the contemplation of Scripture. The contemplation of scripture we know has a content, it's true, but then there's also we say it's an active content, that in, in every reading of scripture there's an encounter with the living God because it's the word of God, and the, and the primary author of it, of course, is the Holy Spirit who is still living and active in it and comes into us and moves us as we, as we contemplate. That's why we do things like Lexio Divina. That's why we read them in the sacred liturgy, right? And, and so there's a power there, but also there's an analogous power within contemplating the lives of the saints, God uses the stories of the saints to strengthen our faith, hope, and our love, doesn't he? Those theological virtues that are, so, that are the center of the Christian life. As we read about other people, it does strengthen us. We hear and read about them. He moves us. He can move someone to follow him more closely. Look at the story of St. Ignatius of Loyola when he gets the leg injury. And he's, he's, he's kind of holed up there. And then he wants all these books on fighting and knights and these knight errantry tales, and they don't have anything like that. And the sisters hand him, you know, books on the saints. If 
first he starts with the life of Christ, and then he starts with the lives of saints. But what's interesting, in his, in his writings later, Ignatius describes what, what was happening to him. So when I read the other books, I was all excited, and then later I'd be empty, reading these books about knight errantry. But when I read the lives of the saints, there, there was a peace and a stirring within me, kind of changed me. It changed his desires. Reformation of desire can happen. I think that's one of the things the lives of the saints can really do. Reform our desires. Change what we want. By seeing the way these people live, it, it can change what we want from something that won't really fulfill us to something that really will. And if we really want to buy, no offense, but a Lexus, you know, we're going to spend the big money on the Lexus, we want to buy that thing. And then we read the life of St. Maxim and Colby, and then you look at it and you go, uh, I don't think it's worth it. I, and I don't think it's going to give me what I want. And now, it's fine if you have a, But what I mean is, someone who's really talking, you know, got all the brochures, but thinks this is gonna, thing is going to make me happy. And it's a neat piece of machinery. I'm sure it has a lot of excellence in building it. But that thing is not going to make you really happy. And reading the lives of saints, it's kind of, you see it. You see, how? I, I always, when I think about the life of Maximilian Colby, and the witnesses of people who were alive, and still, probably some of them are still alive, but when I was a kid and I read his, read his book, there were, there were witnesses, you know, right after his canonization and things like that, that were describing him and what he did for them and how he was joyful and also the horror of the things that were happening and the joy that he could spread. And, and it always made you just wonder, like, wow, that's what I want. <laughs> that, that's, I, whatever he had is what I want. That's the kind of thing that can, that, that can reform us Reform our desires. Uh, move us to follow Him. To see what's really good. To have us start desiring virtue. Sanctity. To see those things which we hear, and, and sometimes they seem almost as, you know, tasteless as water, and we're, we really don't have a craving for them, do we? But in reading the lives of the saints and seeing them, seeing them live these things, and seeing the real joy and excitement, that the real joy, the real adventure of life is in these things, in reading the saints that will help us. What really makes a great heroic life worth living. A life worth living. And you could almost say that about a saint. Every saint, life was worth living for them. Is a life well lived, full and well lived. Even if from a human perspective, you'd have to say, even, even they lived it fully into the hilt. So this idea of reformation of desire, I think, is very important for our own day and age. And I think it's important for our young to infuse their imaginations with an alternative view. And, and, to, and to start thinking and influencing. You know, I always think about even, even people who are dating. And one of the biggest things that has to happen is in dating people need to start really changing, their, changing what, what attracts them. Purification of attraction. Are you attracted to virtue? Are you attracted to goodness? Those things. Uh, you know, a purification of, um, of attraction and a kind of an influence on who you choose as your friends and, and who someday you'll choose as your spouse. And of course, as we see their example and we see how, how amazing they are and we see, see these things happening, this course leads us to seek their intercession. This leads us to seek the help of the saints who are more than just an example to us, they're real people. They're people who we can call upon, people who we can reach out to, and who will respond. Sometimes in, in, in very uncommon ways, in ways maybe we never thought of, and sometimes in ways that might amaze, but they will respond. And this is the most important aspect of our relationship with the communion of saints. We're always asking them for prayer. You know, oftentimes when we call upon the saints, it looks like we're just asking for stuff. You know, St. Joseph, help me, help me get through this. St. Therese, give me the same patience that you had, right? We can say those, those prayers. But we're really asking when we do that, even though it looks like just asking for a specific thing, help me with this, we're really still asking, in reality, we're asking them to be our intercessors, to pray for us. To be our intercessors with Christ and then to be his instrument in carrying out the work that needs to be done. Which is not always the work we want done, right? But it's the work that needs to be done. Because 
in reality, they're in complete union with him. Everything they do is with and for him in an easier way than here. The best things we ever do are under the influence of grace. They always are. The only thing that will last are the things that we do under the influence of grace. Yeah, we could make something neat like the Pantheon in Rome and it's lasting still, but someday that's going to crumble. But it's certainly not going to last to eternity. But, but the things that are done under the influence of grace will last forever because they're, they're God's and ours. That's an amazing thing to realize, that they're God's and ours. And so the saints do it with ease because everything they do is his and theirs. And all the you know, alloy of, of weakness, disorder, and egoism is out. It's just them and Christ operating for the salvation of souls in a pure, beautiful, creative and sometimes unsettling way. So that's what's happening every time we pray. We're saying, pray for me. We, we can see this very clearly. Most of us hopefully have had uh, prayer cards for a servant of God or, or, or a blessed, right? And we notice we're praying for a favor to be in, oftentimes for a miracle of some kind, something very clear, miraculous thing. But when we pray, it, it usually has a formula that goes along this line. If it be your will, let this... Be done, Lord, through the intercession of blessed Jimmy, you know, uh, whoever it would be. <laughs> and so that, that's, that's what we're doing. We also, in asking, though, we open up, the, again, that relationship, uh, and we gain their companionship and guidance. We gain a very personal relationship with the saints in Christ, in the love of Christ, as I said before. Companions and guides in particular matters. We call them patrons, right? Patron saints of this, patron saints of many things. What a beautiful and amazing thing that is. To look, look after various things. They look after causes, patron saint of a particular cause, groups, patron saint of different kinds of work, patron saints of different kinds of situations. St. Jude, right? Patron saint of hopeless causes. Pray to him. And then there's people who are ratcheted down difficult causes. I think St. Rita's in that category. There's so many different patron saints. And oftentimes, many of the patron saints are assigned these areas by the church's teaching. You know, the church says, this is the patron saint of so-and-so, of this or that other thing. And then sometimes it just happens by acclamation. St. Anthony, patron saint of, what is he patron saint of, right? Lost things. How many times, when you're a little kid, your mother says, hey, Hail Mary, and ask St. Anthony for help. Then if you find it, you've got to say thank you and, and say another Hail Mary because you found it. And just an aside on this, that's awesome that we do that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. People are like, oh, it's superstition. Well, we say, we'll find it if we find it, Lord, if it's your will. But there's a kind of peace that comes every time you say that, isn't there? You may, you may be like, oh, I've got to find this. And, and there's a peace that comes, and all times we do find it. If we really need it, we're going to find it. And there's a, there's, there's a strengthening of our faith because God, God does it. And plus, the other thing is, it takes humility and it's childlike. And other people consider it childish, but it's not. But they'll consider it childish and, and you could be mocked for it. But it is, in the end, it's a beautiful way of handing ourselves over to God, isn't it? In, in the smallest of things. And oftentimes when we lose stuff, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of riled up and angry. So I don't want to pray. You know, you don't want to pray at that moment. You just want to just rip your house apart and find whatever it is, right? <laughs> and again, that's another beautiful lesson, to pray in the midst of, of emotion. And, and there are just so many, so many great, great patron saints. Uh, you know, I have a, this is a great book. If you ever see it, I put the plug in for my alma mater, the North American College, Pontifical North American College. This is the Manual of Prayer, and it's got a lot of different stuff in it. It's got a lot of Latin and English prayers. It's, you know, it's, it's an English book, but there's a lot, many prayers in Latin. A couple of things in, in Italian, because that's, that was there to help us do things in Italian. But in the back, they have a really neat thing. It's not exhaustive, but it's a list of patron saints, and they have everything from patron saint of firemen. It's St. Florian, Lucy, and Agatha. It's got three. You know, your patron saint of First Holy Communion, St. Tarsisius. We know who the young, the young saint who guarded the Eucharist. And Blessed Imelda Lambertini. Well, I don't know who that is, actually. But uh, Fisherman, St. Andrew, that's an easy one. Flora, St. Therese of Lisieux. Um, funeral directors, St. Joseph of Arimathea. Isn't that great? And Dismas, the good thief. Canonized by who? Christ on the cross, right? 
and um, grocers, St. Michael. I don't know why St. Michael, but St. Michael. He's, uh, and then, uh, so the, it can go, you can go on. Headache sufferers, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Rita of Kasha, because I guess the, you know, the stigmata that St. Rita had. Hospital administrators, St. Basil the Great and Francis Cabrini, we can understand them. Hospitals, Camillus de Lilly, John of God, all these great. And you can keep going. You can just read your patrons. But it's, it's beautiful that there are all these patrons that we have to call on. And it's good for us to look at the different things that we do and to know who our patrons are and to call upon them. Uh, call upon them and, and ask for their help, ask for their guidance and things. But another beautiful thing about patrons are we can also come up with our own personal patrons. And we really should. As, as we go through the lives of the saints, first of all, we're attracted to some. And that's, not, that's no mistake. Yes, there's a natural attraction sometimes, just their lives. Well, who put the natural good desires in you? God, who made them attractive? God. I mean, so that's even part of God's providence. But even within that, I think we also have to say there's probably a supernatural tug, something more than just the surface, what we're seeing on the surface. And, and that's really a saint calling us into relationship with them. And we should, we should kind of follow those, those slight tuggings and move towards saints. And not even feel bad. Sometimes we'll have lives, part, part of our life, we'll be really into the one saint. And then we'll always mention the saint, but maybe they're not as, you know, in the fore of, of everything we do. And that's fine too. Because saints for different moments, friends for different moments, right? And, and we also have them kind of become patrons of different aspects and parts of our lives or for people. Uh, you could see, you know, a, a father should be appealing to St. Joseph. That's a simple one, Right? Appeals to St. Joseph, let me, let me love my wife in a selfless way. Let me love my children in a selfless way. Teach me. That's, that's a relationship that a man should have with St. Joseph. Someone with a wayward son might pray to St. Monica. St. Monica, help him. You, you, I know you can. You've done it before. Help me help him. You can ask for saints that had certain personality traits that we know we need. Give me a more joyful disposition. Give me, give, me, give me help with that. And a great example in the church that we kind of almost codify this is the use of confirmation saints. We invite kids to figure out who do you really like? Who do you want to model your life after? Who do you, who do you want to follow uh, as a Christian disciple? And, and take them. Pick them. He's yours. And of course, as, as we're looking at all these kind of a panoply of saints, so many great figures, so many beautiful ways that God has reproduced himself in the lives of people in the church. Uh, we can have so many different devotions to them, and, but we can't have devotion to them all. There is, of course, a devotion to all saints, which is a great devotion. We have a, we have a solemnity in our church here for all saints, uh, which commemorates, actually commemorates the bringing of many relics into Rome and the establishment, as I mentioned earlier, the Pantheon as this Church of All Saints. So underneath there are the, are the relics. Underneath the Pantheon today are the relics of, I don't know, thousands of martyrs. And they knew the martyrs because their tombs were marked in a certain way in the catacombs, which were outside the walls of Rome. And this was kind of a frisky time uh, in, in Italy where it was hard to go outside the walls. You go outside the walls, you got mugged and beaten up, so they decided to bring them in so people could pray to all the saints inside the walls. So... Uh, that's what that establishes. But, but in that, we remember all saints. And those are saints whose names we don't even know, and maybe the saints who we don't always get to pay attention to. And we can remember them all that day and just be grateful for what God gave us. But we can't have devotion to every saint, although devotion to the saints is an integral and absolute part of the faith. But there are some relationships with certain saints which are universal. Uh, or if I had to say it the other way, aren't optional. These are people who every Christian, whether they know it or not, has a relationship to. And who every Christian, if they have grace coursing in their soul, these particular saints have had some involvement in the Holy Spirit's producing that reality, that new life in them. And of course, I think some saints we can think about, everybody should have devotion, of course, to the apostles. Uh, these are, the, to a lesser extent, but, we, but to the apostles, because who they are. They were the, they're the beginning. We, we also have a certain devotion to the apostles and the evangelists, the writers of the Gospels. And, and we have to include Paul is an apostle. We know that, right? So we include Paul. So it's not just the original 11, then 12, and then the evangelists plus Paul. You know, devotion to them. Another one, devotion to guardian angels. Now, 
I haven't mentioned angels. This is not about angels. We understand the angels as part of the communion of saints, but in a, in a different way. But the interaction that we have with the angels in prayer and, and receiving their assistance and guidance is very similar. Uh, and in some ways, with the guardian angels, very particular and intense. Everyone should have a devotion to their guardian angel. It's not like, I'm into angels. No, we each have one. And, you know, so this room, just we've got to double the numbers of who's in. If we, if we do a number, so if you're counting numbers, you have to make sure that we, we, we double the numbers of how many people are in attendance here, right? And there might be more because the school probably has a patron saint who's probably a patron, uh, a patron guardian angel. But, but every person has one. And it's silly not to pay attention to them. We should, we should be praying to our guardian angel, seeking his guidance, um, and, and, and speaking with him. Some people like to name him. You don't have to do that. Sometimes I wonder, like, if, if that's always a good idea anyway. He might not be happy with it. No, he's happy with everything. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what we would come up with. And then the archangels, of course. Uh, uh, Gabriel, uh, Raphael, and Michael. Those guardian angels that we know, whose names we know. Uh, that have been active. We need to have a, a certain devotion to them. But what stands out especially is Joseph, and then at the height of all of them, these are the two biggies, are, is Our Lady. Our Mary stands out uh, especially. In fact, she has, we say she has pride of place. There's a special and unique relationship with Mary and Joseph with the incarnation of Christ, isn't there? Completely unique. Completely special. And it makes them unique among all the saints, and exceptional in their intimacy with Christ, right? And in their mode of participation in the redemption, a different way. They participated in a different way in redemption. We all participate in the redemption. We all are enjoined in Christ's work, but they were in a different mode. When I say mode, a different way. There's not just degrees. They're holier than me. He's holier than me. He does more for God than me. Yes, that's true. But then there's a different way. No, not, not the normal way. And through this, through this participation, through this intimacy, there is also a, a deeper, a unique intimacy that they have with each member of the body of Christ. Mary's unique among all the saints, and she had a unique she has a unique vocation. She's called to be the mother of God. This is the central reality called the doctrine, the central doctrine, the central reality of Mary. Mary is the mother of God made man. The Theotokos, the God-bearer. All flows to and from this reality. All of our devotion to Our Lady uh, and every grace that God gave her flows into this reality and then comes out of this reality of who she is, who she was created to be, who she was in the mind of God and then what God made her to be. She receives the graces to be a real mother to Jesus. Think about it, a real mother. Redemption's not a pantomime. It's a real human life. It's a real human life lived. She was a real mother to him. Think about what that would mean. And he would be a real son. And he would be subject to her under the fourth commandment. We know that. She would know who he was and be this mother to him, not just like a conduit, kind of taking his flesh from her. Some people like to say that, but that's not the way God operates. God respects his creation too much, and he won't use a human being like we would use you know, an old plow horse to birth polo ponies and inseminate them, or however they do that. You know, He doesn't do that. No, he creates a real relationship has her as his real mother and enters into a loving relationship with her as his mother. And all the gifts that we see given to Our Lady that we speak about, especially when we talk about the Immaculate Conception, the fullness of grace that she has, all these things, of course, lead her to be ready and her desire for perpetual virginity. I don't have time to go into that one, but she had that already in her. She was already desiring that. Uh, the dialogue with the angel makes much more sense if we understand that. And these graces, and that was a grace too, these graces that Our Lady had prepared her for the Annunciation and the continuation of what happened at the Annunciation. It prepared her for her fiat, for her yes. Because her yes was not an ordinary yes. May it be done is how we translate it. 
It's kind of an interesting thing that she's using kind of a passive, may it be done to me. Why is it being said that way? Why, why is she speaking that way? She doesn't just say, yes, let it be done. It's a much more open-ended yes. Because our Lord, in the Annunciation, did not just open up a discreet act for her to give flesh to the Word and, and make Him incarnate, as I said before, but He entered into a new relationship with her that would be forever. From that moment on, the relationship will be forever. It's not a transient thing. And her fiat matches that. Her yes, the best way to say it, she, it's, she says, I'm the lowly handmaid of the Lord. What does the handmaid do? We know in the Psalms, there's a beautiful psalm that talks about as a maid with her, with her eye on the hand of her mistress, watching what she wants, whatever. She, and, and the handmaid watches whatever he wants. The slightest move I will react to. And this is fiat. So she's, she's describing that she will move to the slightest impulse of our Lord and follow it in any way. And it's an open-ended yes. The yes of marriage. It's, it's the yes like a woman would say in love with the man who asked her to marry him. I don't know where it's going to take me. I don't know where you're going to go, but I'm with you. And I'll be with you and, and we'll, we'll cover the adventure of life. But for this one, this was a yes that said all of your intention all of your plans, I say yes to. I don't know what they are. And she didn't know what they were. But she said yes to them. And so in this moment, and in this yes, our Lord forges a new relationship. She who was always the daughter of the Father, daughter of the Father through the grace of Christ already given to her in anticipation of His sacrifice, right? The pure grace of Christ that was given to her in anticipation. She was the daughter of the Father and loved him with a pure and beautiful filial love. And there's so many reflections we can have about her as the new Eve, with, with an even deeper relationship than the first Eve had. Even before the Annunciation, she had a deep relationship with God as her father. And now, opening up, discovers, and becomes mother of the Son, and spouse of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overshadows her, and he doesn't leave. He stays there. And she remains who she is to him, his spouse. That's unique. No one's mother of the Son but Mary. No one's spouse of the Holy Spirit in that way but Our Lady, right? So she has a unique relationship with the Trinity which our Lord forges in her. And through this, she will have a relationship with all of us. Uh, this will be her relationship that will become clear. It becomes clear in her life as she starts to intercede. The last words we hear her say, do whatever he tells you. And before that, they have no wine. If they have no wine, do whatever he tells you. She's interceding and then admonishing us to follow. She prays for us, admonishes and that's all she does. And then we never hear her say another word. And it's funny because Our Lady is not present for any like the glory moments. She's not Palm Sunday. Maybe she was there, maybe she wasn't. We don't know. But we know when she was there. For standing at the foot of the cross is Our Lady. And then there is revealed who she is. She's mother of all. It's revealed. John Paul says in Redemptoris Mater, his great encyclical on Our Lady, he, he talks about that. He says, you know, oftentimes people say, that's where Christ made her mother of all. No, actually, he says, we really have to think that, that when she conceived him in her womb, the head, conceived head and members, because we know that Christ at the moment of his incarnation, taking humanity, unites all humanity to himself, from the moment of his of beginning, you know, taking, taking flesh. He unites all humanity to himself. And as such, Our Lady does give birth to Christ, head and members, and his mother, to all the body of Christ, right? And so she may not fully understand or grasp what her fiat meant, but now at the cross, our Lord is revealing to her what the fiat meant. You will be mother of all. Her instinct was to be mother and now the instinct under the Spirit was to be mother, and now she is mother of all. And that's revealed. And we see that in the life of the early church, that what we know, I and mean, we, we just see Our Lady one more time, and she's at Pentecost, and she's praying with them at the most important moment, isn't she? And then she fades out of, out of the picture. And we know by tradition, we know as a truth of the faith, that of course she was assumed into heaven body and soul at the end of her earthly life, and she continues to be the mother of all, queen of heaven and earth, and mother of all 
in the order of grace. Second Vatican Council teaches us that. Mother of all in the order of grace. So Our Lady continues to be mother. And when we say mother, it's not just a figurative thing where she kind of looks after us and gives us kind of spiritual milk and cookies when we come home from school. Um, she, she remember that relationship with the Holy Spirit. She's still spouse of the Spirit. St. Louis de Montfort speaks of that in a beautiful way. He says that, that Our Lady continues in relationship with the Spirit and the Spirit brings her with Him and uses her to reproduce, to reconceive the Word in every heart. Beautiful, isn't that? And that's why um, it's been said by, by theologians in beautiful ways um, that Hugo Rahner said this, the brother of Karl Rahner, the good brother. Um, he said that Our Lady stands at every baptismal font. Our Lady stands beside every baptismal font. And so she's, she's the mother in the order uh, of grace for everyone in a, in a very real way because of her relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit could do it without her. God could have become incarnate without, without entering a relationship. He could have done anything of these things without these things. But this is the way he chose to do it. And he's made her a part of it. Just like he didn't have to have the church. Or maybe he could have had the church hierarchy populated by angels. We probably would all have been a lot happier. Maybe we think we would have been, right? Uh, but he didn't. And so this is God's chosen way. And this is what he does with it. And, and so with her, he doesn't act without her. Not because he can't. He could because this is the way he wants it. That's what he does. Um, St. Joseph. St. Joseph is, is, is a great... Well, first of all, he's just a great saint. But the whole story of St. Joseph in the church, especially in the last 500 years, would be a beautiful study of development of doctrine. The greatness of St. Joseph is, is a little bit late in being recognized. Teresa of Avila said that when the glory, the true glory and greatness of St. Joseph is known, all the angels and saints of heaven will raise a great song of thanksgiving. St. Teresa of Avila is one of the people that were really on to him and how good he was. It, at least in the West, I can say that there, wasn't, there was no church dedicated to St. Joseph until the 16th century. It's interesting, isn't it? 1500s, not that I know of. Uh, certainly not, not, none, that, none that I've been able to hear of. And uh, I, you know, I've kind of hunted around on this a little bit. But that's not a long time in the, in the history of the church. And it started, no, no mistake, in Spain. That's where the first dedicated church, churches were. Uh, and Avila might have been one of the first in Avila. Um, might have been one of the first. But now, of course, he's in the Roman canon. That was inserted by John XXIII into the Roman canon. Uh, so he wasn't always in there, but he's now he's in the Roman canon. Uh, the, the Eucharistic prayer, the church, the first one, the most ancient one of the West. And he's patron and protector of the universal church. That's huge. You know, the, he's been named patron and protector of the universal church. It doesn't get much bigger than that. And, and I think it's a, I say development of doctrine because it's a deeper understanding. We're, we're coming more deeply to understand the humanity of Christ and to contemplate the humanity of Christ. That he really was a little boy. At the same time, he was God, knew he was God, always knew he was God. Always enjoyed the beatific vision, always enjoyed the full vision in, in his human intellect of his divinity. Always knew it, always was. Yet at the same time, he was a boy. And he had a father. And he acted like his dad. And he worked where his dad told him to work. And, and this is a twofold thing to think about. The first thing to think about is... God's going to choose a man that he will be like. Think about that. God gives corresponding grace to whatever he's choosing someone to do. He, Joseph must have been an amazing person. He must have just been a phenomenal, phenomenal man. But second, Joseph knew what he was getting into. Jo, jo, but Joseph, Joseph knew what he was getting into. I'll end, I'll end here. The humility of Joseph. He knew what Mary was. If anybody in the world could have known who Mary was and what she was, he did. And he knew who Christ was. And he knew he had to be head of that family. And he knew he was the weakest of all of them. Uh, the humility of Joseph. The openness to grace. What a, what a great saint. And, and, and this is a simple, I'll end here, our relationship. It, it, the intimacy that our Lord had with Joseph 
His relationship to the Holy Family is now his relationship to the church. His intimacy they had with Christ is now his intimacy with each of us in the body. And he can act as our father too, our foster father. He can act for every man as a guide, every woman as a protector. Thank you. I think we'll end there. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Father. Right, By the way, um, donations. Um, <laughs> the Institute doesn't run for free. And uh, if, if you're able, please do consider a contribution to our cause. We are trying to just revive Catholic adult education to bring lectures like this, not just in popular topics like this one, but a holistic understanding of a Catholic faith and a true appreciation for all of its glories, whether it's understanding aesthetics and the nature of beauty when it comes to art and architecture and music, or apologetics topics like this. So please do consider that. We're going to take a brief break, so please stand up, say hello to someone next to you. There's wine and cheese in the back, and then we'll have questions and answers in a couple minutes. If everybody wants to find their seats, we're going to go ahead and get started with Q&A. Father, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for being here this evening. It's a joy to witness the love that you have for all of the saints. My question surrounds the quality of prayer. Mm -hmm. I find, and I'm sure I'm not alone, that when I'm praying, I feel that I'm saying those same words over and over. My mind's getting distracted with earthly matters, and I'd like to improve on that quality. Mm -hmm. How can we do that? I think a couple things. First of all, I think a story that helped me uh, was given of, of um, about St. Philip Neri in Rome. Uh, it, it's a great story that, that was told me by somebody, you know, it gets passed down. Uh, but there was a story of a young seminarian at this church across uh, that St. Philip was at, and it's a church called San Girolamo, and he actually had rooms in the church, but they were up on a balcony, so he'd come out on the balcony, and he'd go out there and pray, and he could see the Blessed Sacrament from there, and there was somebody praying, and, and St. Philip could read souls, could see what's going on in them. And this young man was, was praying, and he was distracted, and he basically was saying, ah, I'm having crappy prayer, this is ridiculous. And he keeps distracted, and he keeps coming back to our Lord and be like, ah, oh, I'm distracted again, I'm distracted again. And as he gets up to leave, he thought, oh, this is, you know, I, I stuck it out, I did my whatever he's supposed to do. And he's leaving kind of, he's feeling somewhat discouraged. And he hears clapping from, from the balcony, and someone's saying, bravo, bravo. And he's saying, that was beautiful prayer because you didn't give up. Another, another way to look at it, sometimes we, in, in the spiritual life we have, to, we have to flip things around. Every temptation is a chance to say I love you to the Lord. We wish we didn't have them, but it still is a chance to say I love you to the Lord. Every distraction is another chance to say I love you to him, to turn back. And we may have a million distractions in ten minutes, and but every single one is a chance to, to make a new decision for him. My mind is like, you know, a box with ping pong balls in it. But Lord, whenever I can, I'll, I'll focus it to you. So each time, and there has to be kind of a calmness about it. Sometimes we can multiply devotions and they can be too much. And that, that can happen. It's good to talk to a priest. But reality is we need those devotional prayers. We need the vocal prayers. We need mental prayer. We need it all. We need a whole package, right? We need all those different kinds of prayers. So the key is like, if we're having trouble... With the rosary, I see it can be a hard prayer. We could be like, what? I just moved to another mystery, and I don't know where I am and what I've been doing. I've got to go back. <laughs> right? What's, what's the solution to that? So you say, stop praying the rosary. Don't stop praying the rosary. You know, we need the rosary. It's a lifeline from heaven, right? Just, you know, it's, it's try harder. It's kind of good. But no, be calm. And just, and just keep a sense of humor and keep trying to lift our mind and heart to God. And say to Our Lady, Mary, help me contemplate this mystery. And there's all sorts of different ways. You know, sometimes you have a person in mind for every, every Hail Mary you pray. It's, it's a beautiful way to pray. The there's lots of different ways people can... I think people should have conversations about that. You've got to be careful not to be bragging about your like, spiritualness. But um, sometimes things that are helpful to you uh, might be helpful to someone else. Uh, we gotta, again, we've got to be careful about kind of spiritual kind of revealing too much of our, of our spiritual life. That's, that's a bad habit to get in. But I hope that helps you. It's just, it, it's, it, everybody has distractions. It drives you nuts. And the main thing to do is turn that into something that, that is the fodder of love of our Lord. Do it with love. 
uh, and he likes it. Anybody else? Yeah, we've got like 10 online questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. But one coming in is, could Father comment on what the church teaches on Our Lady as co-redemptrix? Yes. Uh, uh, you know what? When I, when I was speaking about uh, Calvary and our, and our Lady at Calvary and her participation in our Lord at Calvary, and even uh, actually everything I said was, was about her being co-redeemer, redeeming with Christ. But we understand it in a, in a broader sense of, of how every person, in, in a sense, participates in, in God's redemptive work in their own life and the people around them, and even joins in the sacrifice of the Mass and in other things, joins themselves to what? The one same sacrifice. But we're in it now. So there, there's an aspect where all people participate. The thing about Mary is she's unique. And the Church has not, has not had an ex cathedra statement of co-redemptrix. Possibly because the term itself is not precise enough. It's true, but it's not as precise. She does it as mother, right? So that her, re- her co-redeeming is a unique, higher order than anybody else's participation in the Passion. It's as mother. And, and, and this is something that, that John Paul commented on, that Our Lady's fiat, which is that joyful jumping into, was repeated at Calvary. She intended, like the Father... And like the son, for him to be sacrificed. That inside her there was, there was not just, okay, I'll let it happen, but there was an entering into and a willing of what was happening with her son. That's a very profound mystery and a beautiful thing. And that's the sort of sorrow, of course, that we know. But at the same time, it was a sort of sorrow in a heart of love, united with Christ, and sharing in a way that we can never fathom his desire to redeem. And that's where we talk about our co-redeeming. In that, in that union of heart with her son. So that's why we don't have it. Go ahead, next person. We've been talking about what, what I would describe as the official saints or saints of the making in mm-hmm. terms of honoring them, following their example, mm-hmm. and seeking their intercession. Could you comment on other souls, relatives, perhaps, that have you know, passed on, right. where we also honor them, uh, follow their example, and mm-hmm. seek their intercession? Yeah, I, I think... I think First off, what we always do, and um, you know what my father always says, just like, don't canonize me, pray for me, right? And we all, we all say that. As Catholics, we pray and pray and pray for the souls of the faith who departed. And the job of a good son, a good daughter, a good friend, a good brother, a good niece or nephew, is to pray for those people. So first and foremost, before we do anything else, we pray for them. But when, when, you know, when someone dies in the arms of the church, especially when someone dies in the arms of the church, we have a certitude that they're you know, heading towards God, whether they're in purgatory or in heaven already. We don't know. We remain agnostic on that unless the church canonizes them, right? Then we have some certitude at that point. But we don't have it before that, and we continue to pray for them. Yet at the same time, yeah, I think it's, it's a natural thing to say, as I pray for you, pray for me. You know? And of course, just that simple thing, it's a matter of justice. You had a grandmother who was an amazing woman. You better remember her. And you better follow her example. That's just natural. I mean, everybody should do that, right? You should honor her, keep her picture, tell your children, have them tell their children. Everybody should know. And we should pass on the memories as, as much as we can and the virtues and the goodness and the love. Okay, two last quick questions, one from online and one from here. Pat from Rome, New York, is wondering, uh, do the saints do the actual healing or guiding when you pray to them, or is it Christ working through them? Yeah, we, we, had, we had spoken. It's Christ, of course, working through them. We know that. Did Peter, you know, raise people from the dead? Did Peter cure the blind man? Did St. Philip Neri raise someone from the dead? No, it's, it's always God working through them. It's the idea of instrumentality. It's the idea of God using them as his instrument. But yet, in another way, we say, yes, they do do it because they want to do it. God says, I want to use you to do it. And they say, please do, and they do it. So it's God and man together, always, uh, working together in a, in a beautiful in a beautiful union. Uh, Father, you mentioned St. Ignatius yes. uh, and the Bible and his reading of the saints while he was recovering mm-hmm. from his wounds. Is there any place in his writings where a particular saint impressed him? Hmm. You know, I, 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 have to, I don't know. You don't hear priests say that very much, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I could have made something up, but I actually don't know. I'm not a big expert <laughs> on, on St. Ignatius. I know, you know, I've read, I've read it. In the spiritual exercises, there's not, I didn't recall any particular saints uh, sticking out, so so I, I I don't know. Maybe someone else knows. Well, he had a great devotion to Our Lady. Yeah, 
Yeah, and he was, he was a big proponent of, of, of Our Lady, Christ coming to Our Lady after the resurrection. In fact, he said it's one of the, I, if you think that Christ would come first to Our Lady before he went to anybody else, you're thinking with the mind of a Catholic, with the mind of the church, which I, I like that one too. Because there are some art in the church of, of Christ appearing to Our Lady after the resurrection. Now, it's not, it's not de fide or anything like that, but it's a beautiful thing that we, we can and I, I think would recommend to believe. Because it's, again, that natural familial thing. That's it. Thank you okay. so much, Father. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.